السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي وسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة عيوننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وقال تعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق سقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون صدق الله العظيم As always we commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is our protector, sustainer, nourisher, curer and creator. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his choicest of blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family members, his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyamah. Indeed, the best of speech is the speech of our beloved Maker, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best of guidance is the guidance with which our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. And indeed, the worst of matters are the newly invented matters. For every newly invented matter is an innovation. And every innovation is a misguidance. And every misguidance is in the fire of Jahannam. May Allah the Almighty save us and protect us from the adverse consequences of our evil deeds. Ameen. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, as we are about to witness the officializing of a nikah in a few minutes, I deemed it all the more appropriate to base today's short talk or lecture if you will uh, regarding something to do with nikah. As after all, that is what is the purpose behind these kind of lectures, as is the case with the weekly sermons, the weekly khutbahs, where the khatib, he addresses in regard to something which is pertinent to the society at that moment or at that time, or else the ummah at large. But instead of going into tips and advices, I thought of inshallah ta'ala basing today's short talk on three important main factors and these factors if any slave of Allah were to adopt these three factors bring it in his life or her life he or she is bound to be blessed with a happy and peaceful life in this dunya and likewise they are bound to see success in the akhirah they are bound to see success in the akhirah before we go on into those factors let me ask you all a question. Why do you think Allah the Almighty created all of us? Why do you think Allah the Almighty created all of us? Why do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the seven heavens, the seven earth, every single thing you see around you? Why do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all of this? The trees, the mountains, the rivers, the animals, the plants, ourselves, human beings, the jinnah. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create all of this? The universe, the planets, the stars, the moon, the sun, all of this. For one reason, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, Allah the Almighty, He says in the Noble Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I did not create mankind and jinn kind for any other uh, purpose other than the ibadah, other than the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sole objective behind our creation is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sole purpose, nothing else. All of these creations, all of these creations that you see around you, every single thing was created 
for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what is the purpose? What is the goal behind the ibadah? What is the goal behind worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Once again, our maker himself says in the Noble Quran, Ya ayyuhan nasu abudu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum walladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. O mankind, worship your creator, alladhi khalaqakum, the one who created all of yours, walladhina min qablikum, and the one who created the ones who were before yours, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you will become people of taqwa. So that you will bring in taqwa in your life. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, the sole objective behind our creation is ibadah, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the objective behind ibadah is nothing other than taqwa. Taqwa, this is factor number one from the three main factors that I wish to touch in today's short talk. Number one is Taqwa. What is Taqwa? Some people have translated Taqwa as the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whilst others have translated it as the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But both coupled together brings about a beautiful explanation. Imam ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahimahullah he mentions in regard to the definition of a taqwa, a taqwa is an Arabic term which stems from the root waqa yaqi wiqaya, which means to put up a protection, to put up a barrier, to prevent yourself or to protect yourself from something. Imam ibn Hajar rahimahullah, he says, taqwa is to put up a barrier, to put up a protection for you from the from you incurring the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ghadab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how are you going to do this? By adhering to all of the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and staying away from all that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited you from. Let us look at what our salafun as-salih, Ridwan Allah ta'ala alayhi majma'een, say about taqwa. Once a man goes to Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he asks, Ya Abu Huraira, can you define taqwa for me? Can you explain taqwa for me? Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he asks that man, Ya Raju, or man, have you ever walked down a thorny path? Have you ever walked down a thorny path? The man said, yes, of course I have. So Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu then asked him in return, So what did you do whilst you were walking down the thorny path? He said, I gathered my clothes together. I gathered my clothes together and took precaution, moved away from the thorns and walked down the path. So then Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says, That is exactly what the definition of taqwa is. Why did you move away from the thorns? You were fearing that you would snag your clothes onto the thorns. You moved away from the thorns so that you would not harm yourself. Likewise, a taqwa is that you take precaution that you do not snag yourself against the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the muharrama of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which are those thorns in that path. The path is this life that we are traversing upon. The thorns are the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We take precaution that we do not injure, hurt ourselves whilst we move on that path which is this life. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, we live in dark times. We live in dark times. We live in times where materialism is glaring at us left, right and center, wherever we look. We live in times where a culture of warriorism, exhibitionism is being promoted. Men are being taught to look at whatever they want to look, however they want to look, whatever they wish. Women on the other hand are being taught to exhibit themselves. They are being taught the more flesh you show, the more attention you will get. This is the time we live in, totally against the command of our maker Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah the Almighty says, "Kull al-mu'minina yaghdu min absarihim wa yaqfadu furujahum." ذلك أزكى لهم. أو رسول الله أو محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم كما tell the believing men to lower their gaze. But on the other hand, what is being promoted today? Warism. Look, whatever you wish, however you wish, it doesn't matter. You look at whatever you want. Hook yourself onto anything, whether it be online, whether it be in the real world. Wherever you are, look at whatever you want, whoever you wish. That is what is being taught to us today. But the words of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala: Lower your gaze, protect your private. ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ For that is much purer for them. إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَسْنَعُونَ Indeed, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is most aware of all that they are doing. Allah the Almighty, who gave over a billion human beings the sight to see, do you think that Allah subhanahu wa taala is blind that He cannot see what we are doing? Whether it be in the real world or the world on the web, today people, we are hooked onto different sins. Whether it be in the real world, whether it be on the social platforms, whether it be on the internet. People are hooked on to different sins. People think that if you erase your cookies, if you go on private mode, nobody is going to know what we are doing on the internet. If you delete the history, no one's going to know. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, the malaika who are making record, they write down every single URL you type, every single video you watch, everything is being recorded. On the day of Qiyamah, everything is going to be played right in front of you, in front of the whole of mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching every single thing that we do. This is what taqwa is all about. Bringing in the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why I said that it is better to couple both of the definitions, fear and consciousness. Because fear is not something that prevails throughout 24/7. But on the other hand, consciousness is something which is always ingrained within you. I know that Allah the Almighty is watching me. I may be in the corner of the earth. Nobody can see me. Nobody knows me. I may be in a foreign land. Nobody knows me. I can commit a sin and no one knows me. My good name, my reputation is not going to be tarnished. But Allah subhanahu wa taala is watching me. Whether I be alone or whether I be amongst people, I will not commit a sin. This is what taqwa is all about, my dear sisters, elders, and brothers of Islam. This is factor number one, and this plays a great impact in whatever we try to do in this world, my dear sisters, elders, and brothers of Islam. You might be wondering now, what is the relationship between nikah and taqwa? Of course, there is a big relationship. What is nikah? Nikah is from ibadah. If your intention is proper, you entering into a bond of nikah. The minute you sign on the dotted line, you are fulfilling a great worship. You are acting upon the command of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, following the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Today, all of us, all of us, we wish to have good, beautiful, obedient spouses. All of us want a happy married life. All of us want beautiful, obedient children. All of us want this. All of us wish for this. Do any of us wish that our marriage should go on the rock? None of us do. So, what are the steps that we need to take to secure this blessed relationship, the blessed bond of marriage? Number one, adopt taqwa. Bring in taqwa into your life. So, the minute taqwa. Starts governing every action of yours, you are bound to achieve success in this world as well as the hereafter. Moving on to factor number two. Factor number two, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, is mutabaatul habib, following Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, following our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Today, if one of us were to think, I feel a bit spiritually high today. So let me make Salatul Asr eight rakat. I feel pious today, so I want to make Salatul Asr eight rakat. 
I come to the masjid and start praying eight rakahat. Oh, I feel like making Salatul Maghrib ten rakahat. I feel like fasting three, four months consecutively. Is it possible? Will it be accepted? Do you think that you will get more reward for praying eight rakahat of Salatul Asr? No. Why? Because it is the pona. It is incumbent that we follow the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent to teach us how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of our ibadah has to be based on the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if we wish to attain success in this world as well as the hereafter. Look at the beautiful statement of my beloved teacher Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. He says, إِذَا غُرِسَتْ شَجَرَةُ الْمَحَبَّةِ فِي الْقَلْبِ إِذَا غُرِسَتْ شَجَرَةُ الْمَحَبَّةِ فِي الْقَلْبِ وَسُقِيَتْ بِمَاءِ الْإِخْلَاصِ وَمُتَابَعَةِ الْحَبِيبِ أَثْمَرَتْ أَنْوَاعَ الثِّمَارِ أَصْلُهَا ثَابِتٌ فِي قَرَارِ الْقَلْبِ وَفَرْعُهَا مُتَّصِلٌ بِصِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى Words that deserve to be inscribed in gold. He says that if the tree of love, Allah Akbar, the tree of love, what love is he talking about? Once again we touch back to nikah. What love is he talking about? Love, the purest form of love. Love for Allah the Almighty and our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If that tree is planted in an individual's heart, okay, and it is watered now. Every tree has to be watered. And that tree is watered with the water, pure water of ikhlas, sincerity, and the following of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sincerity touches back to taqwa. Whatever we do, we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why am I entering into this bond of marriage? Is it because my father-in-law has promised me a BMW 5 series? Or is it because I'm getting an apartment in Kalambo 7? Why am I entering into this bond of marriage? Is it because for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, that Allah Akbar, it becomes a great ibadah, ikhlas. This tree has to be watered with ikhlas and mutaba'at al-habib and then what happens? The tree starts to grow and the tree starts to give out fruits. The roots of that tree become firm in that individual's heart. The tree of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The roots become firm in that individual's heart and its branches go up to Sidratul Muntaha. Where is Sidratul Muntaha? That was the point where even Jibreel alayhi salam could not cross when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went up to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the point even he dared not to cross Allahu Akbar. This tree, the branches would reach Sidratul Muntaha if it is watered with ikhlas and mutaba'at al-habib. We follow the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in every aspect of our life. But sadly today, many of us suffer complexes to look like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The, the minute a sportsman, the minute an athlete, the minute an actor grows his beard, now that has become the trend that is the fad, now that is in, everyone's ready to grow their beard. The minute he cuts his hair in a way, everybody is ready to cut their hair in that way. But if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam grew his beard, we feel ashamed to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How are we going to face him on the day of Qiyamah? He cried, Ya Ummati, Ya Ummati, Ya Ummati. His only cry was for us, but we feel ashamed to follow him. We cry out that we love him, we love Rasulullah. The best way to show your love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is by emulating Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is by following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is by bringing his teachings into your life. Is by adopting his life as our life. We do everything according to how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. 
And that is when the matter of innovation come in. I started off by saying that the worst of matters are the newly invented matters. And every newly invented matter is an innovation. Every innovation is a misguided, and every misguided is in the fire of Jahannam. For if we encourage bid'ah, if we encourage innovation, if we take part in innovation, if we act upon innovation, why Allah forbid, if we ourselves initiate an innovation, what we are saying is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not do a proper job, Allah forbid. We are trying to say that we know more than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي. Allah subhanahu wa taala perfected the deen with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now none of us can come and say, no, this is how we should do ibadah against the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We dare not say that. We dare not say that. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, that moves us to the third most important factor. فتقوى المتابعة الحبيب the following of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم to come into our lives properly, perfectly the third factor is important and that my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam is knowledge is knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the noble Quran قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Oh, Rasulullah, oh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, can the person who has no knowledge and the one who has knowledge be equal? Can they be equal? The one who is ignorant and the one who has knowledge, can they be equal? Never. In another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا لِلْمَدَارَةَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised the ones who have brought in iman and the ones who have been given knowledge, daraja, rank after rank. This is how much importance our deen places for knowledge, for seeking of knowledge. For if we are to be ignorant, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, we will not even be able to differentiate between what is sunnah and what is bid'ah. And it is not even permissible for an individual to enter into a bond of nikah if he does not have the knowledge of nikah, of what he is supposed to do. It is not permissible for us to trade in the market if we do not know the sharia perspective of business. Umar radiallahu an used to say that if you do not know how to trade according to our deen, then get out of the market. Get out of the market. This is how important seeking knowledge is. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says that the importance that has to be attached to seeking knowledge has to be much, much more the importance that individual attaches to food, water, food, water and drink. He goes on to say, what is the worst that can happen if a person does not consume food? What is the worst that can happen if a person does not consume water? He will die. If we do not eat and if we do not drink, we are going to die. He says, what is the worst that can happen? That person is going to die. It does not matter. But on the other hand, if that individual does not have knowledge, what will happen? He is going to be roasting in the fire of Jahannam. If you do not have knowledge, how are you going to pray? How are you going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How are you going to follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So for these two factors, taqwa, and mutaba'atul habib to come into our lives, may the respected elders and brothers in Islam, we have to work hard. We have to seek knowledge in regard to it, and that is why it is so important in our religion seeking knowledge. Only then will we be able to emulate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just as how he taught us to. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, I leave all of you all with a final advice and that advice is directed at the group but it applies to all of us at large. Today, my dear brother, you, the minute you sign on the dotted line, you are beginning a new chapter in your life. You are beginning a new chapter in your life. Begin this chapter fresh, you and your spouse. 
turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turn to Him in sincere tawbah. Allah the Almighty is waiting to accept your tawbah. Turn to Him in sincere tawbah and start off this chapter fresh and clean. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be conscious of Him at all moments and at all times, for that is the only way you can hope to attain success in this world as well as the hereafter. For the minute you bring in taqwa, naturally mutaba'atul habib will come about. You will only follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, for all of us, it is important that we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before it's too late. In regard to tawbah, in regard to tawbah, there is one scary thing, a scary reality. Tawbah will only be accepted as long as Malakul Mawt does not come and stand right in front of you. The minute Malakul Mawt comes in front of you and you say, I turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, forgive my sin, the Tawbah will not be accepted. The Tawbah will not be accepted. And the second condition, after the sun rises from the west, Allah Akbar. Sign after sign is taking place. Qiyamah is extremely close by. The minute the sun rises from the west, the door of Tawbah will be slammed shut. Currently the door of Tawbah is wide open. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is waiting for us to turn to Him in Tawbah. All of us, if we were to touch our hearts, we know of the sins that we were involved in, that we are currently involved in, and also the sins that we are planning ahead of us. Allah save us all. We know of the skeletons in our closet. We know of the sins. Some of the sins are apparent, some are hidden. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive and hide our shortcomings. But each one of us, we know of our sins. And it is upon us to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek forgiveness and turn to Him in tawbah. Sincere tawbah. Tawbah and nasuha. A pure and sincere tawbah. Allah the Almighty is waiting to accept us. For the minute the door slams shut, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, even if we cry tears of blood, even if we cry tears of blood, that door of tawbah will never ever be opened again. The minute Malakul Mouth comes and stands in front of you, even if you cry tears of blood, Malakul Mouth does not care whether you are a president or whether you are a road cleaner. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are. You may be the greatest man. Malakul Mouth comes at his stipulated time and he will take your soul as he has been commanded to do so. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before it is too late. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of our sins and may he accept all of our good deeds. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this nikah that is about to take place in a few minutes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the two spouses. May he fill their hearts with pure love for one another. May he unite them forever. May he bless them with a good life in this world as well as the hereafter. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them with beautiful obedient children who will be a coolness to their eyes. And may Allah the Almighty unite all of us in the gardens of Jannah with our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In alhamdulillah. In alhamdulillah in ahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'firuhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihillahu fala mudillala wa man yudlil fala hadiyala. Wa nashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lam. Wa nashadu anna sayyidana wa nabiyyana wa maulana muhammadan abdullahi ta'ala wa rasooluh. Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وقال تعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Ya ayyuhalladzina amanu Takullaha haqqa tukatihi Wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun Wa qala ta'ala aydan Ya ayyuhalladzina attaqu rabbakum Alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidatin Wa khalaqa minha zawjaha Wa basta minhuma rijal ഹലീതീ <Sessizuk> يُصْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَمَنْ يُتَعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم النكاح من سنتي وفي رواية فمن رضب عن سنتي فليس مني أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهد وآخر دعوائي الحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم